Do you want to know how to start working your way up to owning great SaaS businesses that are cash cows or learning how to flip them? Hi, I'm Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Business the Podcast, and today I'm speaking with Andrew Piano, who is a UC Berkeley grad. He has built three profitable companies, exited one, and currently acquires small SaaS companies at XO Capital. XO has done seven acquisitions to date and is on target for one million in revenue in 2023. Now, in this podcast episode, Andrew and I talk about why startups are so hard, the pressure and the stress on them, and why so many of them fail, and then why Andrew decided to start buying businesses, specifically SaaS businesses. So we talk a little bit about his story. We also talk about what you should be looking out for when you're doing due diligence on a software business. Obviously, there's the common things. We lean in and talk about how to do software due diligence where you actually need a partner, a developer who's a partner to partner with on the site, not just for due diligence, but owning the site as well and how critical that is, especially for a SaaS business. We also talk about the cost of owning a small SaaS business. We talk about the small product surface of a SaaS business, which can help for growth. We talk about a lot of other growth activities that can be put into customer service, making the product better uh, and you know retaining and retention uh, for growth of a business. So product led growth. And then we also talk about where Andrew finds his deals from and where he sells those deals as well. So there's so much value in this podcast episode. If you're looking to buy a SaaS business, either now or in the future, this is mandatory listening. Enjoy. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Jared. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this chat. So we just connected on surfing. You live in Santa Monica, surf quite a lot around the globe, which is quite cool. Uh, it's always good to talk to people that are ocean lovers and business lovers. I think there's so much in common that I, I draw from surfing and life into business. Do you find that similar to yourself as well? Yeah, but um, I'm like, I'm a fair weather surfer and I'm probably a fair weather business person too. <laughs> so like I can, I can definitely see, you know, you got to roll with the punches, right? Like you got to be in the right place at the right time to catch the right wave, like, you know, leverage, right? You're not going to catch something if you're not like going the same speed as the wave, all, all those kinds of things. And then I just, you know, in my daily life, just blatantly ignore all the good advice I, I, I know. <laughs> I, I doubt that. I doubt all of it's been ignored. So you've been buying... SaaS businesses. And when did you start buying SaaS businesses? Two and a half years ago, I put a ragtag team together. It was really like an open call to anybody that wanted to like start wiring money to each other on the internet and buying software businesses, right? That was kind of the start of it. And yeah, we started two and a half years ago and bought a, a really tiny first deal. Why software businesses? Like, why did you want to start buying software businesses? What, that, what, what about that business model excites you? So... I was, um, I was CTO of a small venture studio here in Santa Monica. And um, that was like all straight venture stuff, right? Like we had a portfolio mm. of three companies we were trying to build and then spin out and raise venture for. Um, and then the other part of the business was just pure venture. So we were just, you know, like writing checks. I wasn't, but the other part of the venture studio was. And over time I became CTO of one of our portfolio companies. We raised 8 million bucks, had like, you know, 25, 30 people at our peak. And after five years of struggling through that business, it ended up going to zero. And I looked around and said, man, isn't uh, starting a business hard? Might there be some easier way or, or less risky way to do this? And I started following Andrew Wilkinson and seeing what like Tiny Capital is doing, Sure Swift, some of those guys and thought, why not? Let's just try it. Let me just put, I don't know, 10 grand that I'm perfectly happy to lose learning, call it like my little mini MBA and um, find some partners to de-risk it a little bit. And let's go buy a couple of these things and just feel it out. I'm a software engineer by training. So like, I don't know anything about e-commerce, all the content stuff that you guys talk about is way over my head too. I'm like, sheesh, man, we are like woefully underutilizing SEO and content to grow these things. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was kind of the start. I think a lot of SaaS businesses don't have the best content marketing strategy, to be honest. When I've looked at some SaaS business, I'm like, look, you, I love, I love focusing on retention, and uh, I love, I love membership is membership and SaaS businesses for that reason. And you know, a lot of the marketing can go, or marketing budget should go into product and and service. There's a lot left on the table with uh, no content marketing strategy, especially for Evergreen. Yeah, it holds the business in a solid way if it's good evergreen content and it's 
organic. <laughs> Part of it's a skills gap. You know, I think um, mm. it'll delight your users to know how long it took us to just get one blog post per week per company to an email list that like sends out and have that that work. That took forever. Um, I wouldn't say it's like the highest quality thing, but like that is the extent to which we are doing like content marketing. Yeah, yeah. There's so many similarities in what you did um, to myself, except I definitely am not a technical guy. I was a plumber and I uh, started to try and make money online through a few startups, didn't really do anything. And I was like, hang on, I should try and buy one. And so you started around 10 grand for your first one. I started around similar price range, 15 grand, and then worked worked my way up. And yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see that you've had the, you had the same chain of thought of like, why don't like, these startups are really, they're grueling. They're just insane, aren't they? Like what, yes. what, what about the startups made it a no brainer for you to buy a business? Um, you mean, why did the, why was venture so hard relative to buying, buying a business or what went wrong with the venture backed company? Yeah. I think the problem with, um, venture in general is that particularly a couple of years ago, right. In a zero interest rate environment, like that's, that's like free money. And so a lot of capital was flowing to companies that had really no business being a venture scale business. Um, I, I, that wasn't the case for our, our big swing, let's call it. It was a full on enterprise SaaS. It was a machine learning company. And if it had worked, it would have been a large company. It was one of those kind of swing for the fences type bets. I think some of the challenges that we ran into is sales. So under investing in sales before you run out of money is hard. And then some corollaries to what we're doing now, like, and, and, you know, this kind of influences what we try and buy today. When you have a product that is for an enterprise and you're selling six figure ticket sizes, that's really cool, right? You get one customer, they pay you a hundred grand plus a year. You only need a couple of those for it to start to get meaningful. That's really, really cool. The downside is it takes six to 12 months, sometimes 18 to close one of those guys. And they're going to demand everything you've got and then some, right? So you are, um, you know, slave is the right word, but you, you, whatever their request is, no matter how large you're basically like, you can't say no, especially as a startup. So, so, so managing those long cycles, those long sales cycles while raising a bunch of money um, is, is just really challenging. The other part too is when you go out to raise and let's say you raise like a pre-seed round, um, that's relatively straightforward to do, right? You don't have to have any revenue. Here's kind of like, here's the people, here's the idea. Uh, they're like, okay, great. Here's half a million bucks. Like come back when you've got a product. Every time that you go back for more money, the bar gets raised on you. At the beginning, right, everything's potential. There's no numbers for the VCs to pick apart. Everything's just like gravy and like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? Imagine a world where, right, and you just fill in the blank. It's like playing Mad Libs. But as the, as the kind of months and years go on, um, those VCs are comparing you against these companies that are like lottery ticket winners, right? All of them have hockey stick growth. And, yeah. you know, are you going to be like in the top 10% of those portfolios? Probably not. And so what happens to those middle tier companies is like they die, right? That's why venture backed startups have a relatively low success rate. And mm -hmm. my insight actually, and we don't have the capital to go and execute on this, but there's a whole kind of world of distressed venture. So, you know, we spent 8 million bucks in five years building this really cool thing and it went to zero, like, like just straight zero. But like, that's kind of crazy to think about. Like, was there zero value created? Was there zero dollars worth of like IP created? And mm -hmm. I think the answer is no. So again, we don't have the capital to go and execute on this today. We're, we're um, bootstrapped. It's just the three of us buying it with just our own cash. Um, but yeah, there's a whole world where I think um, that kind of like those companies that fall off the venture track um, have a place to land. And we've actually bought two Y Combinator companies. Are you familiar with that? that uh, accelerator YC no Y Combinator. It's one of the, 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 if not the most famous like startup incubator in the world. And, and they crank out like hundreds of, of startups every year. And, you know, many, many household names have gotten their start at YC, but even more right fall off and, and go to zero. But again, that's not many to say more, that right? they haven't fall off. And go yeah. To zero. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And, but, but a lot of them, you know, they might have 50,000 a year in revenue, a hundred thousand a year in revenue. And it's like, they're not venture scale, but if I take all the engineers and fire them, <laughs> right. Or like, you know, they go away and we hire some developers out of South America or 
you know, at the beginning, like yours truly would just jump in there and be like, oh, I think I can handle this. We can, we can make it so that that 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars a year is kind of significant um, for us, right? Small fries. That's like, yeah. um, that's pretty decent money for depending again on how much effort we have to put into each of these little businesses. Yeah. I, I don't know much about uh, raising, raising funds and, and doing the whole uh, startup and quick start up to try and get hockey stick growth. One of the philosophies that I have is that the more pressure and stress that we put on ourselves, the less that we typically, because we're operating from a place of fear, the less better we perform because we the less sleep we have. And there are the instances where, you know, sometimes where people are on the ropes, they will come out swinging and do really well. But I think more often than not, it's, it's the opposite where there's so much pressure and stress on a thing to work that with the little sleep and the stress on the, on everything team time, it makes it, makes it hard. And I think that's why even if, if like the startups that I've started very small, like without millions of dollars, like it's tiny, 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 you know, penny pinching on a shoestring, uh, even just with one human being, it's, it's tough. So this is why I think there's a big shift into the purchasing of things that have a proven track record. So when you decided to move into things that have, a, you know, SaaS business have a proven track record, you can just literally utilize your skills, right, as a CTO and add way more value than trying from the bottom, right? Have you, have you noticed then that? Than trying from scratch? Yeah, trying from scratch because you've got way more leverage there to, to work on. Yeah, so a little bit of self-awareness. I am a terrible picker of things that other people will like like the and and not in a cool way right there's like tastemakers who are like oh like that thing is going to be really cool in five years that is not me okay the things i think are cool like no one else things are cool meaning i build stupid ideas and i know this about myself um and so one like superpower again is like even if i find something with in the SaaS world like 25 50 customers that to me is like that's product market fit you know that's that's yeah. pretty good right like yeah. I've had plenty of ideas that that never got 25 customers, let alone like one customer. And so for me, I'm like, okay, um, I actually like, I probably over index on looking at the existing customer base and, and saying like, I trust that, right? Like I trust that there are real dollars there. And of course, you know, we can talk about diligence, but like you gotta look at the bank accounts and make sure people aren't like doing weird stuff where they like have their friends subscribe and then like there's kickbacks on the back end, but like, and then yep. you buy it and then all the revenue goes away. Like all that stuff you got to verify, but, but, you know, by and large at face value, like the first thing we bought was like an, a, a total and complete commodity. And I don't even think I understand that business still today. It was a tool called screenshot API and it takes, as you might expect screenshots, right? Like it's a developer tool. So people need to take like tens of thousands of these things. It's got like the weirdest customer base ever. And like, who needs all these screenshots? Like that's not a use case I've ever encountered before. But when we bought it, it was, it was you know, we bought it for like, I don't know, 20, 25 grand. And um, it was making, I think $500 a month at the time. And there was like 30, 40 customers. And I thought to myself, like, you know, there's a little foothold, let's see what we can do here. Yeah. I love it. So when you look at something like that with the due diligence, so specifically around SaaS, the software due diligence, being a, a CTO, because there's a lot of people listening to this that their goal is to buy a SaaS business because it's like usually the glory business. It's like the legacy business, buy something and it's just got it's just got really good profit margins. And, you know, it's the most one of the most passive types of digital assets you can have if it's depending on what type of asset you buy of course but typically so so many people are wanting to buy these SaaS businesses what are some of the things they should be looking out for when they're doing due diligence on the software are you saying you know have somebody help with the software dd part of it because myself i would not know how to do just the software on a screenshot uh type SaaS product yeah there's um I think there's two different answers. One is if you're not going to partner, like you yourself as a solo operator want to buy a SaaS business, but you're not technical, you need a partner of some kind, whether they're on you know the cap table or by the business with you, or it's the person from Upwork that helped the other founder build the startup. Like you need to have that person involved right. in some capacity. Yeah. The, the loveliest ones that we've bought have been ones where A, 
And I think this is really important for like an initial acquisition. The surface area of the product should be quite small. So screenshot API, what does the thing do? Take screenshots. Does it do these 900 other things? No, it does not. It takes screenshots, right? So the surface area of the product is small. And what that is as close to I'll ever admit to being like passive income. And by passive, I mean, for us, we have two of these where I'd consider them relatively passive. Again, have a small surface area on the product side. Um, we bought them nearly complete. Um, so it, there wasn't a lot of investment on our side, right? We were doing the due diligence to know that we wanted to buy something that was relatively passive because we bought stuff before that we thought was going to be passive. And it ended up being that, you know, all of these feature requests were sitting in, you know, intercom or some like chat support system. And there were a ton of people that were willing to pay for the software if they had all these features. Um, mm. that's not the case when you buy something that has just like a narrow, I call it just like a single promise to the customer. So again, yeah. does the thing take screenshots? That's what I need. Great. They sign up, they pay that smaller surface area, I think is really important. It also makes diligence easier because frankly, there's just not that much code to go through, um, mm -hmm. which helps a lot. And I think the thing for us too, and this is where I start to kind of drift into just like putting my CTO hat on. I like, we have three full-time developers now but the buck always stops with me. So I'm like the fail safe. I don't want to have to do this, but our worst case scenario for a bad technical buy is me doing like a diving save, right? And um, that's nice to have, like that's one of our kind of, I guess, competitive advantages. But for somebody that's non-technical, that's gonna have to be that person on Upwork or um, you know, whatever, wherever they found that developer. They're going to have to get somebody that they can ping at any time because stuff's going to go haywire. Even just yeah. in like the natural growth progression of a small startup, like things break because you don't want to pay for bigger servers than you need. Right. Um, so like at some point, those small servers, if you're growing, even at like 5% month over month, you're going to need to like scale those things up. And unless somebody's watching, you're going to hit a limit or wake up at 2 a.m. and get like, you know, Yell, customers yelling at you that the, the site's down or something like that. So again, the first, like, so step one for us, we go through and like, I just want to know where the bodies are buried. So every single one of these is probably crappy, cr crappily built. They're probably built quite fast, right? Again, I'm talking sub, let's say anything that makes less than a hundred thousand a year. Yeah. This is not like pristine code that is going to like sunset you into like your lifelong cruise on the Caribbean. Like that's not what this is going to be. The, I would expect like the first one to three months, you're going to have to invest probably the most you ever will on the engineering side to Correct. fix things, you know, listen to customer support, see if there's like actual features that you really, really, really need to build. And if you're not able to go through the code yourself, then I think you definitely need somebody to at least like look through the architecture and look through um, the code base, make sure that it does the things that it says it does. Um, right. So people can put like a bunch of features on the site and you go to use it and it's like, they just put a button there, but like, you know, the button on the front page is the tip of the iceberg. You got to have all the code that actually <laughs> like does the thing. Exactly. And then just, just a quick note, like on IP, cause I think a lot of people get stuck in this, like, oh, well, like what's proprietary. The answer is probably nothing. Probably nothing is proprietary. There's probably no patentable anything in your software. It's probably a total commodity. Um, and it's probably copyable, right? So me looking at somebody else's product for most of these like micro acquisitions, I could buy, I could go build the thing in like two or three weeks just by myself. Yeah. Just like yeah. I could, I could just go copy the thing wholeheartedly, but that's not what you're buying, right? You're buying sort of a, like the brand. I don't, I don't want to call it brand because brand's like a whole thing, but it's like a, the starting point of a brand, uh, and the customer base, right. And this, and, and then of course all the content stuff that you already know about. Yeah, it's, you're basically buying product market fit that needs some some serious work to add to it to get it to a point where the competitors aren't just going to squash it in one foul swoop because they've got gazillions of dollars, right? Say like say like Zoom comes along and says, hey, like you just need to take screenshots like all the time or like another software that might be similar, like a tracking software that Upwork actually uses screenshots, you know, lots of yep. screenshots to the track tracker uh, up you know virtual assistants work uh it's i'm glad there's so many things to unpack there andrew i'm glad that you said that it's not like not you that you're buying something sub 
100k you're you've got a lot of work to do like a lot of people will come and say jared i want to buy a a software business and i got 15k i got 10k and you you've done this but you are a cto you you've done this this is your whole career behind this and you know what and you've got investment to put into this smaller asset whereas most people it's 15k is all everything they've got and they want to try and make it work so if you are in that camp first and foremost congratulations you got 15 grand it's good everybody we shouldn't compare ourselves to everybody else because we're all born in different places and, and have different circumstances. Maybe start with a, a different asset than getting into SaaS because, yeah, you need to, like you said, Andrew, you need to force some capital into it and maybe even more than what you purchased of that. For example, are you open to sharing how much you poured into the your first one that you bought for 20 grand, Andrew? And what that was? Uh, yes. So that one's, that one, uh, we bought for 25 grand. There were three partners. So 25 divided by three, that was intentional. I just wanted to do this and then wrangled two other poor folks to like, you know, come and partner with me on it. And we yeah. bought it and do during diligence, it was in a programming language that I just don't like and think is old and I'm, you know, kind of a snob about, and we immediately rewrote the whole thing. But I went, I, I walked into that deal knowing that I'm going to spend a, an absurd amount of time, Andrew, writing code to yes. rebuild this thing from scratch. Um, yeah. And that's what we did. And I don't ever want to do that again. But for the first one, I was like, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever it takes, right? Like, what, what is it going to take? Yeah. To, yeah. Um, so yeah. that one, again, we weren't paying for a developer, but um, I was doing it. So it was like my hours. If it was, you know, an hourly rate, it would have been like, you know, I got paid a dollar an hour so far, right? Like we haven't taken any money out of the business, which is a whole nother thing we can talk about too, that the reality is like running these things when stuff goes wrong um, and you have to pay for a developer to go and fix yeah. things. That's a variable yeah. cost. That's really hard to predict. And generally speaking for our tiny ones, we run like slightly negative generally most months, because I think the, the other part too, and I know we're bouncing all over the place, but like the income with SaaS can be super lumpy. So if mm -hmm. they ran like a promo deal in February, three years ago, there's a ton of annual payments that come through in, in like February, right? But then you're starving by like June, July, right? Nothing's coming in. So I think actually like you look in a Stripe dashboard and it says like your MRR is $2,000 and you're like, sweet, I get $2,000 a month, but no, you do not you might get like 4,000 some months and like zero some other months too. And so managing the cash flow in that way is also like, that was one of the bigger surprises too, getting into the space. Yeah, check that out during due diligence, guys. Black Friday sales um, can alter the the average monthly revenue. It's it's funny, if I find the people that are really good with their own personal finances can be really good with business finances. And uh, that's where a lot of, I like to help people fix their leaky bucket syndrome, what I call, before they get, before they even chuck money into a deal. A lot of people come to the space and say, Jared, I want, I've got this amount of money and I want to use finance to buy the deal. I normally ask them, how, how, have you got any other debts? And what are they? Are they personal debts, credit card debts? Because if you're not great with your own personal finances and you're going to buy a business and pour finance into it, the money can leak out just as fast as, as it's coming in because you don't know how to handle it because you haven't worked on the smaller stuff first. And that's not to poke holes at anybody, but it's just to get people aware that finance is cool. It's really good. But especially with online assets, it's there's the risk involved, right? Have you, Absolutely. Have you, you seen much of that before? I mean, you, you have with like startups being financed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my, my personal finances, I, um, I don't know that I'm the best with personal finances, to be honest, but yeah, I mean, I mean, being really frugal on um, spending when you have just a certain amount in the bank and you have to make something work, it's really tough. The, the real benefit is that we, the three of us that initially started this for the first year and a half, didn't take any money out of the business. And it was only, it was only at January of last year that um, one of the three partners went full time and started taking a salary. So I'm still not a burden to the business. Um, and the other partner is still not a burden to the business. And we're still just like writing checks occasionally to fill gaps, right? Because we have payroll now and some headcount and um, are continuing to try and be just as frugal as possible. Yeah. And what is your goal with these? Is your goal to sell them eventually or to hold them as, as cash cows to reinvest some of that money into other assets? You know, sometimes people, I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, but, um, 
I was told by various people, like, start with a thesis. So like, what's your investment thesis? And we, for the first couple of months, we're like, okay, great. We got like this thesis, it's so specific. And do you, do you know how many deals matched that thesis criteria? Zero, there was zero. We didn't buy anything because nothing matched it. So we were like, okay, maybe a thesis like isn't the right word for this. Um, and so we ended up buying like three little things pretty close to each other. And, and to date, like, I still don't think that we have enough cash to really have any kind of a thesis. We have bought SaaS app, like there's, let's, let's say there's two categories of SaaS applications too. There's like B2B enterprise SaaS, right? So you're selling high ticket deals to like other enterprises. These are like larger companies, right? These aren't somebody that is like a freemium model and comes and signs up and spends 10, 20, 50, hundred, under a hundred dollars per month with you. These are like you know, thousands of dollars per month type of, of customers. We've bought a couple of those and those are way different operationally than these self-serve freemium, right? Where you come in, there's a two week free trial and a certain amount convert and it's your tweak. And those are kind of the knobs you tweak, right? Like where's my top of funnel? What's my conversion rate to sign up? What's my sign up to paid rate? What's my retention? Um, all that stuff we have since started buying more kind of product led growth as it's also called or freemium type products, right? Those are much, much easier for us operationally. And again, we're still trying to focus on like those single promise to the customer, but in terms of finances, there's really not that much money coming in the door on a monthly basis above like our base payroll costs for these smaller businesses. The, the money comes from sales of these businesses. So if you're really looking to compound capital, I think you have to flip them. I think you have to. I think you have to do that because otherwise you're going to wait for these things to start cash flowing. And that accumulation is just too damn slow. I think you have to flip them. So we'd like to be more like permanent capital stuff. And there's some stuff I think we'll hold for a very long time. But our biggest financial gains have come from selling the businesses after we've taken them over, you know, kind of cleaned them up, like giving them a fresh coat of paint and then, you know, sold them on to um, somebody else. Yeah, it's great to it's great to hear because people listening may have the ideology I'm going to buy a SaaS business and just going to sit there and let it just churn out money. Um, and you can do that, but it's going to need it's going to need work. It's going to need development to keep it maintained and to, especially in SaaS, like keep away the competition. Like once you know the competition is is like there's a lot of money in SaaS, and a, you know a big SaaS business can just come and squash one of these businesses pretty fast. So like the growth, I feel like the growth is really needs to be injected quite fast. You know, you don't want to have somebody else come out with a free tool to their SaaS business. That is your whole business model. And then you just like, you're about to sell it in five or six months time. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, you t I mean, part of diligence, right. Is figuring out like, what's the, if something were to kill this, what would it be? Um, yes, there's a name correct. for this exercise. I forget. It's like a pre-mortem. I think they call it um, <laughs> instead of like a post-mortem. So yeah. absolutely, like for these, again, single purpose apps, which are quite close to commodities, you could be killed by a feature in a competitor, a larger competitor. They could also just release like a free tool that does the thing. And they're like, yeah, we'll lose 20 grand a month because like that means nothing to us. Right. And they could just kill your business. Yep. Um, yep. So you definitely have to like think about what could what could kill it. But I, I think I have maybe a weird stance on competition. I just don't care that much about competition. Mm -hmm. It's just, I just haven't seen it affect anything. Um, of course you, if you are going into a competitive space, what are some of the things you need? Your product has to have like at least the same coverage of features that the competitor does, right? Like if you only do one tenth of what at the competitor does exactly. for twice the price, well, yeah, yeah, like it's not gonna work. So, so long as you have feature parity, you guys both do roughly the same thing. I think we have competitors to like, Another one of our, our, our micro tools, a developer tool that um, turns like a Google uh, spreadsheet into an API. It's a developer thing. Um, there's a ton of huge competitors in that space, but you know, some people just like us. They like the way the product looks, right? Um, talk about non-passive. One of the very first people we hired, the very first person we hired full-time was customer support. Um, because no matter what, even if you think it's, it's uh, passive, right? There's still gonna be people with questions. And like, you can win so much business by just responding within an hour to somebody's question um, that they could full well look up, right? They might just be testing you, but it's so nice to be able to just open a chat box and talk to a real human and get a real answer. 
And yeah. we try and win on simple things like that to beat out the competition. Cause somebody might be paying like about the same with us, but they're not going to switch because they're like, oh, well, I can just reach out to like Andrew on the support chat and they always like treat me well. That could be enough yeah. for a customer to stay. That's, that's what you're talking about with product led growth and also marketing budget, you know, marketing budget, it's easier, usually cheaper to, to keep somebody than to find new customers. So where do you, yeah. where do you find these businesses? Like where are you buying them? And then where are you selling them? Are you selling them through network? Are you buying through network? Are you different, different platforms? So the first two I hustled on Twitter. Um, I would just reached out to a bunch of, um, I looked up on indiehackers.com. They have like some people that self-report revenue numbers. And so I just like was looking for something really tiny and cool. I, this is my, this is still my direct outreach today, which we still do all the time. Steal this. It works great. And because it's true and it's honest, um, I say something along the lines of like, I know it's probably not the right time, but if you're ever thinking of selling, yeah, I'd love to chat. And a ton of people respond like, oh, I was thinking, but I don't want to like go through this listing process or like maybe they just have questions about how acquisitions work in general that I answer. Like I've built a lot of goodwill through that. Um, yeah. So the first two were from Twitter, um, microacquire.com. That, that's kind of like the big player in the SaaS space now. I think they just rebranded to acquire.com. Um, we have bought and sold several businesses on there. Um, there's no broker fees or anything like that. They're, they're awesome. And we've recently, we're recently, um, working with a broker to sell our first business with a broker. Um, we've cool. sold the other to ourselves. So we're just trying out the broker thing and seeing how that goes. Cool. Congrats. Andrew, where can people go and find out more about what you're doing at XO Capital? I, I am at, uh, Andrew Pierno on Twitter, P I E R N O. Cool. Guys, be careful. He might be he might be hunting some deals. So, no, it's good. It's probably it's it's a good thing because that is a strategy that a lot of people that are wanting to buy sites, even content sites and other types of businesses, will be able to use as well. So, yeah, I'm so grateful that you shared that. It's it's, it's really good. Guys, cool. check out. Thanks so much uh, for having me, Jay. On, yeah, thanks for coming on. Guys, check it. Check his links out in the show notes. There'll be links there. Um, everybody is listening. Thank you so much for listening. If you're thinking of buying any business, listen to this again. There's so many little hidden secrets and hidden clues in growth and due diligence throughout this. And if you know somebody that's looking to buy a business, share this podcast episode with them. Selfishly, it helps myself and Andrew help more people, but by growing the podcast, it helps us to get in front of more people and you get to help your friends too. So thanks. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy, or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.